Great to have you all here today. So the second reading today, the second reading from the letter of 1 John, I believe it was. My children, I'm writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a guide, a, a, a gift. This advocate with the Father, he is expiation. What does it mean? What is it when something is expiated? Think about the word expiation is related to the word exit. When you exit something, you get off, you go, you, 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 you leave. And so expiation is the sin is taken away. So Jesus is expiation for our sin. And you know, the challenge is we can think we follow Jesus, but we don't keep the commandments of God. And John says, if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. And we don't want to lie to God, but at the same time, if we fall short of keeping his commandments, what are we to do? We are to repent and ask God for his mercy. And the advocate who is our counselor, our guy, he's on our side. He's our defense attorney, if you will. He wants, he wants our sins to be expiated. Now, I just want to start with that, and now I want to quote the first reading for a moment. The author of life. Who is the author of life? The author of life you put to death, St. Peter says to the people of Jerusalem. The author of life you put to death, but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. What does it mean to be ignorant? You know, not to insult anybody, but we've all, we're all ignorant of many things. To be ignorant simply means that we don't know. You know, you don't know, and you don't know what you don't know, in a sense. So we had this reality of ignorance that is part of our lives. A true story that, that I may have told before, I don't remember telling it, but I might have, but there's a true story about a young man, around 20, early 20s at the latest, came to see me one day and he sat on the couch in my office, he looked at me and he said, I don't wanna be one of those guys that says, if I would have known then what I know now, I want to know now. I want to know now. I don't want to wait 10 or 20 or 30 years to know. I want to know today. Tell me, Father Mike, what am I going to say if I would have known then what I know now? Now, how many here could honestly say about their own life, if I would have known then what I know now, I would have done things differently? Anybody? Maybe one or two of you, possibly. So just imagine this conversation and this person comes to you with a sense of respect and, uh, and genuine uh, curiosity and also desire. What would you tell him or her? What would you tell them? Do you have some lessons? Have you learned anything in your life? Now, and I, I really, I want to give you a homework assignment. I want you to go home and write it down. Like, what would you say to someone 10 years your junior, 20 years your junior, 30 years your junior that says to you those things? And let me just give you this idea that maybe, just maybe, you're still ignorant of some things. And that maybe in 10 years from now, you'll be able to look back and say, if I wish I would have known then, I bet you'll be some of the same lessons. Like, what would you say? I, just a couple of things that I might say to this young man. Worry less. Trust that things are going to unfold. Don't worry so much. You're going to be able to handle it. One day at a time, you can take whatever problems and difficulties come to you in life, you can handle them. 
one day at a time. Could you give that advice to somebody maybe? Honor the person that you are, that God created you to be. Honor your name and your family. Be honorable. Always remember that. Never forget it. Maybe there would be a commandment like that. Honor your father and mother, which includes honoring your family name. Where you came from, who you are, who you represent. So, if I would have only known then. Now, why am I talking about this ignorance? Because Peter says, now you know, I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. To be ignorant, to not know. You know, there's a position that kind of is fashionable sometimes in different places and for different people, and that is to be agnostic. What does it mean to be agnostic? A gnosis. Gnosis is a Greek word that simply means to know. So to be agnostic means just a declaration that I don't know. It's to say, essentially, I am ignorant. And it's okay to recognize that we are ignorant, but there are things that we should not be ignorant about. There are things that we really have the power to know. We have an advocate even. We have a power that's leading us to truth. The origin of our life, creation, reality, right and wrong, we can know. And nothing in some sort of respects will be more critical than for us to know, to know the creed, to know who we are. St. Thomas Aquinas, one of my favorite quotes that I do know you've heard, St. Thomas Aquinas said, we are born into the double darkness of ignorance and sin. The double darkness of both ignorance and sin, but by grace and reason, by God's grace, by the gift of enlightenment given to us by God, by God's grace and by the reason that God created us with, we can climb out of ignorance and come to know things. In this life, we're born in ignorance, but we are educated. And then we can reflect back and we can be humbled by the fact that, boy, I wish I would have known then what I know now and strive ever more kind of diligently to know, to know. Ignorance is this theme, and it's this theme because St. Peter reminds us all that the author of life, the author of life, Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life, the author of life, human beings, we, if you will, put to death, we put to death the light, but God raised the light again. The light will not be snuffed out. That's the symbol of this Easter candle, the light of Christ. The light continues to shine. And we are called into the presence of the light of Christ. Now, I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance. And what is our response to ignorance? It's supposed to be repentance, to return. It's supposed to be to listen. It's supposed to be to fall to our knees in humility and ask. The light came into the darkness. We hear in John's gospel, the light came into the darkness, but people preferred darkness to light. We cannot be those people. United to Christ, seeking the unfolding of the story of our lives. You know you're in a story right now. You're in the midst of a grand epic. And this grand epic is the unfolding of all of history and you're a character in it on the stage of all of history. We're reminded of this when it says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, the God of your fathers. And the story unfolds and you're playing your part in it. And you don't want to be in darkness with all the twists and the turns and the sin and the ignorance. But God has given us his commandments. He's given us his truth. He's guiding us. 
in community and truth as children of God. I want to go from that kind of gospel and first reading to really more uh, immediate and contemporary concerns that the world has. And that this past week, the, the Vatican, the Congregation for the, for the Doctrine of the Faith put out a document. And maybe some of you heard about this document being put out. Maybe some of you think it's great. Maybe some of you didn't read it. Maybe some of you heard some news broadcast. But it hasn't gotten as much press as some do because it's pretty clear. And it's pretty, it's pretty uh, definitive. And it speaks, it doesn't use the word wokeism, but it speaks out against wokeism. And the document that was put out is called, it's, I'll just use the English translation, the infinite dignity of man, the infinite dignity of human beings, that by God, because we were created, this is part of our ignorance or our not ignorance, you're not supposed to be ignorant of this fact, that you were created by God. And that God has a plan for your life. And that Jesus Christ, with the precious blood, sanctified and cleansed you from your sin and that you have a destiny in heaven and all of those things give you and me and every other human being that is an infinite dignity so this document was just reminding us of this basic truth about humanity but it goes on to speak about this fact that we're living in a time of this radicalized sense of self And in the radicalized sense of self, then we say, I get to define what is true. So a person that says, I get to define what is true would have a difficult time saying, I wish I would have known then what I know now, because whatever they thought back then was true then. See, but we don't believe that. We believe there's a, a truth named Jesus that's true yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so the church is addressing this kind of, again, addressing this sort of uh, this relativism that has taken root in our society that says, I'm the measure of all things. I know everything. And, and this document pointed out that that's the oldest temptation in the book. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It goes all the way back to the idea of that I'm my own God. And we're not our own God. But when we think we are our own God, we're gonna be very tempted. We're gonna be very, very tempted to put out the author of life. Who is the author of life? Whom you put to death, but he was raised from the dead. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't know everything, do we? But Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. We are not the measure of all that is. So this document goes on to talk about one of the hot button issues of the day, and that's called gender theory. So we've gotten to the point even where when I'm the measure of all truth, even my biology is wrong if I say it's wrong. And so the church has said, no, gender theory is a lie. You were created by God and God has created you in a particular way. And and you're not the author of who you are biologically. God is the author of who you are. And when we fall into this pit of this kind of radical understanding of self that says, I create all reality, and then I can change all reality, and, and we divorce ourselves from the ability to love. And I know I'm getting kind of deep philosophically here, but just hang with me for a second. Because to love someone is to will what is good for them. Truly good. But if good changes every single day, then how do we know how to love somebody? 
because we can't keep up with what's good because they redefine it every day for themselves. So my brothers and sisters, I think it's kind of almost about time that the church wrote this. Life is to be accepted with gratitude and placed at the service of the good. Desiring a personal self-determination as gender theory prescribes falls victim to the age-old temptation to make oneself God. So this is what happened 2,000 years ago. The author of life, humanity put to death, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of that. The light has come into the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. We've all gone through periods of ignorance in our lives, haven't we? We can all look back at some point and say, I wish I would have known then what I know now, don't we? But the church is a wise, master, a wise mother and teacher, and she is teaching us that we have this infinite dignity that's written into our very bodies. We think about the lessons that we've learned and the church continues to highlight for us the pitfalls of agnosticism and atheism and wokeism and this radical definition that I get to define all truth. No, Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. And today we pray that we may always walk in the light of the truth keeping God's commandments.